Thank you very much. And it is a, a real great pleasure, actually, to uh, be joining Eurocree. When Ray asked me, I obviously uh, said yes, we can't say no to Ray, as what my experience is. Um, but actually, uh, having worked on a conference back um, in 2007 in Leeds, um, I know how important this is in terms of collaboration. And um, I bridge a gap, I guess, between being an academic, I don't think you ever lose being an academic, and actually working in business. I took a leap um, five years ago now um, to follow another passion. My passion is events, tourism, hospitality, research, and this, I love this kind of stuff. But actually I was really passionate about high streets, localism, my own local community, and wanted to do something. And when you get an idea, unfortunately, sometimes you just have to leave something you love to pursue it too. So uh, the background, my background in having that academic research has been really, uh, really positive for me because it's been, I've been able to consider wider sort of behavioural trends and what, what I'm trying to do with Shop Happy. But also it's enabled me to see sectors from a different perspective. So when I worked at the UK Centre for Events Management, in Leeds, um, I was able to mix with my events, tourism, hospitality colleagues, and I got to lead research. One of the pieces of research I led at the time was commissioned by the Me Meetings Professionals International, MPI. And uh, it was the Future of Meetings study. And I got to work with amazing academics and also conducted my own research, which I then presented all over the world in, in Las Vegas and Canada, et cetera. And then suddenly I moved from this event sector into retail and high streets and place. And what I was shocked about was that I saw commonalities between the two. One of them was that everything was very short term and reactive. So the events, tourism, hospitality, I'd been battling for years, talking about the fact that we, we had to have future visions that were more plural and we had to co-create futures and we had to look outside our sector to bring in thinking from other sectors in order to forge a future. But also when I went into the retail sector, I saw exactly the same challenges coming up. People just simply reacting, planning three to 12 months ahead if we were lucky, and the future thinking being quite, uh, quite like a tunnel vision of not looking at the outside trends that might be impacting. And it was frustrating to say the least. So I think that there's a problem that we've all got in these industries that every single person on this call can address and can influence. Because we have a short termism in an industry and we have a mindset that perhaps isn't quite as prepared for change as we need it to be. And when I was lecturing, uh, I didn't lecture that much, I have to say, I did more research and traveling around <laughs> than, uh, than lecturing. But when I did lecture, um, I lectured in entrepreneurship so now I'm in the lived experience of the entrepreneur and I look at what I taught and I look at what I experience and some of it is true and some of it isn't. And some of it I, I said to lect in lectures just isn't right. So um, for my lived experience. So lecturing in entrepreneurship, lecturing in creativity and innovation is always a bit of a challenging subject. But what I've realized is that I've probably spent my entire career being quite a disruptor. And disruptive thinking, I think, can be extremely powerful in making you more resilient. And I think that every single person on this call needs to channel their inner disruptor and needs to give that to students and try to get that, the students to become disruptors too. So um, I'm just gonna now uh, get on with actually the uh, presentation after that little bit of a preamble. Um, so the, the focus is disruptive thinking. Uh, I've added the letters after my name, which is very exciting. So, um, but my own research uh, for my doctorate was in creativity and innovation. So a lot of things are, are coming together for me that I'm, I'm really pleased to be sharing. But the first thing is, so I, I moved to the retail sector. So I'm just going to change my, uh, do my slide change. Oh, that's not working. Why is that not working? All of, always a bit of a worry when that doesn't work. Oh, right, there it is. Right, uh, reactions to COVID-19. So over the last year, my own business, my own platform had to change. We had to pivot. We pivoted from a digital shop window to a platform that would enable people to get home deliveries that could operate when businesses were closed and would enable them to trade because my theory was if Amazon can trade a small shop should be able to trade. 
Um, but it was very interesting to look at the different reactions that businesses we worked with had. And it, it took me back to the kind of reactions that I would see in the events, tourism and hospitality industry. And also because I'm still connected to that sector, the kind of reactions that I saw. The first one is this kind of handout, government give me a grant, help me, to a hand up of what can I do in this situation. And the, the businesses were very divided. So some would literally close the doors, say, right, I'm going to just go home. I'm going to wait for the, the grant to come in. There's nothing we can do until things open again. In some cases, those businesses completely stopped communicating with the customers they'd established, which is so dangerous. So we had this point, particularly in retail, where, where customers were spending 40% more time on social media and yet businesses weren't on social media, for instance, continuing a conversation with them because after all, they had nothing to trade. So hand out or hand up is a reaction that really uh, surprises me to some extent that why don't more people put their hand up and think, what can I do? And the adapt or die situation. So an example would be there was a pizza cafe in terms of the adapt or die, he came to Shop Appy and he was a pizza cafe on the coast. His entire business had stopped. And all he could think of was the, the thing that I've still got working in my business is I get ingredients. I can't create pizzas and let people into my cafe, but I have got the ingredients. So I'm thinking, could I create a pizza making kit with these ingredients? And could I sell that through Shop Appy and get customers to make the pizza and maybe share share what they had made at home on social media and so on so I thought this was an excellent idea and a way of adapting that I thought well actually of course you can do that because you can put you can use digital to test ideas so why not put that pizza making kit on it's not something you've done before but who cares we're not in the environment we were always in so why not just do that he put the kit out and on that one Sunday evening, he sold around 50 kits and then 100 kits and it continued to grow. So he adapted. He didn't think he had to close his cafe. So why do some businesses immediately just lock the door and walk away? And others think, actually, let's see, what can I do in this situation? Are you confident as people, educators, that your who of your students would adapt and who would close up shop? Because we need more and more of them to be able to adapt and to think, what can I do rather than I can't do? The other thing is predictable or unprepared. The you know, pandemic was absolutely predictable. It was in our future of meeting study. There will be a pandemic. This isn't, this isn't something that's never going to happen. So how, why were we so unprepared for this? as an industry, as a, as a sector, as educators, because it was there, it was always going to happen. So to the extent to which we are engaging with predictable is often confused because we tend to like to focus on what we want to happen and not things that look uncomfortable and difficult. So disruptive thinking is very much for me about thinking about the, the opposite of what you want to happen and then working out what you would do in that situation. The end of days kind of mindset I saw from retailers. So this is it, the high street's dead. We, we saw nothing but those kinds of headlines in the UK around retail. We'd been seeing it anyway, pre-COVID. But then you look at other some businesses within those high streets who saw this as a great opportunity. So I'll give you another example. So we have an art shop. It's a small art shop. And he did little classes in his art shop for eight people. And in those classes, uh, you know, in his very small physical premises, he, he had the eight people that would come to his class uh, every evening. So when uh, COVID struck, it was the end of days for him. He couldn't access his physical structure. His entire uh, supply chain was cut. He had no way of operating his business. So we met him and started to talk about what about taking your art classes online. Now, all of you have been doing this now for a year, but back in March, you know, think of how uncomfortable we were with this kind of technology. So he started to put his online classes onto Shop Appy. 
And sure enough, the numbers of people that he could get on his online classes turned from eight people to 40 a session. And everybody paying enabled him to continue his business. And actually, he had his best trading months for 10 years. Now he will be going back into physical prem premises. That opportunity is still there. He's created a product which he suddenly realized could be accessed, could open up his market. And as he got more confident with, with following this opportunity, he was able to add other elements. So personalize the, uh, the tools he was using and getting people to buy those online. He got people in his store. So again, to what extent do people see an opportunity? People always say never waste a crisis which is a horrific thing to say, but actually there is always an opportunity out there. To what extent are the students in front of you opportunity spotters? Um, are they able to see uh, in, in amongst all of the noise that there might be an opportunity there? The asking for help or acting alone is particularly interesting for how, again, businesses react. So in, in Shop Appy, we, we work with independent businesses. I often describe them as cats and, and ask my members of my team to join if they have cat herding skills, because these independents want to do everything on their own. But there's a big thing around asking for help. So when uh, I did my doctoral research in creativity, there was uh, lots of research around help giving and help seeking and how different it was in terms of your mindset. So as lecturers and educators, people come to you for help all the time. Well, help me with my essay, help me address this topic. And when you're constantly giving help, you get, you get quite fixed in your paradigm. This is, I must be the expert in this and this is what I do, I give my help. If you are seeking help, you are actually asking your mindset to be opened to other opportunities. And that's gonna potentially give you more creative uh, source to go to. So we saw a great difference from the businesses that actively ask us for help can I do this? Have, what do you think about this? Could, could I get some more help to set up vouchers or whatever it is? The ones that are asking for help are doing better. And they're also asking help from their community. So I recently did a series of webinars for key brands like Ikea and Lego and so on around sustainability. And they, they have major problems in terms of how do we build sustainability into the business? And they're asking internally, they're asking themselves, they're experts, they're staying in the company. And you have to think, why are you doing that? Why not ask the community, say, we've got this really difficult question. How can we solve it and, and actually capitalize on collective crowdsourcing ideas? So asking for help, I think, is a really fundamental thing that we need to be teaching our students to do it and asking is actually a big thing anyway. Asking for help, asking for investment. This, these are the things that will help them grow. So we've got, uh, I've seen events uh, graduates, because uh, obviously I'm still connected to the alumni. And again, it's really revealing in terms of the types of student that are coming out, the types of student I knew who are coming out and creating new opportunities. And I'm not surprised by who I'm seeing doing that because I remember them. So there is a point of that, right, this career that I wanted to do in events, hospitality or tourism over the last year is, has not been possible. I must exit this career. Or there are people that are going, actually, I want to continue this career, but I know it's got to be delivered in a different way. And there's a recent events graduate I saw who had actually now has almost facilitated a virtual broadcast hybrid event design career which will hold them in such good stead for that resilience longer term. Overall, there's the half full or half empty mindset, which is again, really absolutely underpins everything. So I, I remember once talk, being um, described as really enthusiastic and I'm always described as relentlessly optimistic, um, but it's a really good mindset to have because if you are positive or optimistic, you will try to see the opportunity in what you're facing. So that half full, half empty mindset is really, really crucial. So Shop Appy, in, in terms of how we operated, is we were, when we were looking at what was happening in uh, Wuhan in January, um, obviously felt this is, this, this is the predictable pandemic. 
Now, this could be end of days for Shop Appy because Shop Appy needs vibrant high streets and strong local businesses. And our business is about getting people into high streets and clicking and collecting, which is evidently not going to work if this virus hits. So we pivoted and we made the opportunity is home delivery and no one else was moving in that area. There are now, there are lots of imitators now, but actually at that point, nobody was doing it. So we pushed the home delivery, developed the technology. And then the second thing that I did because I'm an optimist probably, is I thought, you know, we have to go back to the purpose of our business, which is changing high streets. And the thing we're going to do is we're gonna offer everything for free, trusting that that will be a good decision that will have a positive end for us. So we took a risk. So taking risks is a major part of entrepreneurship and will be a major part of the future of our graduates. So how do you take risks? Are we encouraging them to take risks and to really center on the mission and vision? I remember do, asking our students to do mission statements for your business. I don't think we ever really got to the core of what that mission actually does. It holds you to making decisions, even at the most rocky periods, to making the right kinds of decision. And the other thing we tend to do is with our mission is, is maybe forget sometimes that there's often a purpose. So we're seeing an increasing number of purpose built businesses, purpose, purpose led businesses, social purpose at the heart over and above profit. So to what extent uh, are they able to reflect on how mission might guide them? Because writing three year business plans, you may as well screw them up. Pointless, pointless in, in a volatile environment that we're going to be in for the next few years. Better to focus on what your mission and you're trying to achieve and then work the pathways to get there, which may be different and may pivot, but you have to know that. And I, when I did move into this outside academia, into you know, business environments, everybody told me the business plan you're writing is going to be 10% as successful as you think it will. And it will take you 10 times as long to achieve. I don't remember teaching that. I don't remember teaching that. So I always used to think, what is my role as a lecturer? Is it telling the students what to think? When you're faced with this issue, this is the right answer. Or is it teaching them how to think? And that isn't just about how to work, use models, because I think what I, what I always saw from my teaching and from you know academia generally from my own learning was that it, it, it totally expands your ability to critically think through things which is so so important for business and it's so much what we need to talk about but how to think is also a mindset issue and the mindset that we're trying to help our students get into is is just critical for the next you know, five years or their lives really, because their mindset, how they have adapted to uh, the online learning environment, how have they adapted to not having the experience they really wanted to have at uni? Have they managed to find the opportunities? We're probably seeing some good indicators right there. So you might be going, oh, Jackie, this is all business, this business stuff, it's all right in theory, but you know, how do we make this something in, in the classroom? What can we do? So I wanted to just throw something out there, which is uh, an exercise that I've used in my own work with panels and webinars, et cetera, but also something that I used in the future of meeting study. And I, I just think it's so valuable for helping people with disruptive thinking. So I want you to pause for a moment and I want you to think about something that you're certain about in the future of the events, tourism and hospitality industry. It might be something you're certain about in terms of the sector. It might be something you're certain about in terms of you as in, in education or in society. But I would love it if you could just take a moment to write down what you think or a few things that you might be certain about. And if you can, I'd really like it if you could pop your certainties in the chat so I can have a look. And I'm watching you now, making sure that you're writing things down. <laughs> I 
Right. They've got all these. People always want to travel. So as you populate, I'll let you, I'll, I will give you actually another, because you, you, you're doing far better than I thought, actually. <laughs> From the webinar now, I'm seeing loads of insights. This is why I miss academia, you see. If I do this with business, I might get about five responses. All right. Consumer interest will increase. Um, I'm really, I'm interested in what the person means with that. Consumer interest will increase. Whoever, so it was Stina, if you can unmute yourself, can you just explain what that is? Hi. <laughs> Did I write that? I, I think. Oh, I don't uh, know. Somebody has written consumer <laughs> interest. That's, that's from Liz Anderson. Anderson. Yeah, Liz. Liz, Liz, can you tell me what you mean? Consumer interest will increase. Yes. Am I unmuted now? Yes. I think uh, everybody's been locked down for so long. More and more people will want to travel. Will want to get out. Will want to eat out. Right. Cool. Thank you for more that. More than ever before. Yeah. So, um, so basically, all, what I want you to do now is whatever you wrote on that certainty, I want you to imagine it's the opposite. So Liz, you're wrong. Actually, people don't want to go out. They don't want to eat out. They don't want to travel. Everybody's saying travel is going to come back. No, it isn't. Nobody's going to want to travel. Nobody goes to countries. That's not what they do anymore. I want you to take the absolute opposite and write that down. And then I want you to think of one or two reasons why the opposite of what I just, what you said could be true. Two reasons, that's all, one or two. And I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. So hopefully you come up with some reasons of why the opposite of what you think is true. Why I use this and why I think it's a really valuable way of popping things, popping balloons in some ways of what we want to believe is that we tend to put a scenario, we tend to focus on a future we want to see. It's not surprising to me that as a group of events, tourism, and hospitality educators, you all see a future where everything bounces back. And you know what? I see it too, because I really want that to be the truth. But it might not be. Or even if it is, perhaps it's not going to be as strong as we think it will be. So I used this exercise years back when I was doing the future of meeting study and I went to Las Vegas and was uh, using the scenarios. And I asked uh, all of the meetings industry people what they saw as a certainty. And you know what they said? They said people will continue to meet in person. You know, of course, they're going to say that because that's what they want, because it's their industry. So I said to, to one of the people that had said that, I'm really sorry to tell you that's not true. Actually, in the future, people don't meet in person. She was so shocked. She said, oh, no. And I said, well, I'm not Doctor Who, actually. I'm not a time traveler. But actually, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that there could be an alternative future that isn't the one you like. So what happens if meetings, if people don't meet in person, what do you do as a business? What do you do as a person in that situation? The worst one I did like this was where I was doing scenarios again and I had a table and I said that, the, that people were going to stop traveling and their faces dropped. People are going to stop traveling, they said. That's not a good that's not a good scenario for us to work on. Why? Well, we're British Airways. But wouldn't it have been good if our travel industry had thought about a future where people stop traveling? 
So when we talk about, oh, I don't know why this is not moving ahead now. Flipping, flipping realities is super important for us to think. And why is it important to look at a different scenario than the one we want? Because in that scenario, we start to consider what things might work. You know, might it be that we need to think about VR, that we, perhaps we need to think about how we could offer hybrid events in quite a serious way, whether we have to think about um, what other types of business opportunities there might be within this uncomfortable scenario. Because had we had a more fuller view of the future, maybe where it doesn't bounce back as quick as, uh, as we want it to and people are hungry for experience, perhaps it doesn't do that, then what are we going to have to do and plug into our businesses to make them more resilient to a future that isn't necessarily the one we desire? There are always reasons why the opposite will be true. What really worries me is that we tend to look at futures which are so linear. And what we did when we, you know, when we did the future meeting study is we absolutely expanded the futures. We made it very, very plural and very, very complicated. And we flipped certainties on their head. So there's linear thinking around, well, people will use social media and people will use devices and people will do these things and they'll go more online. And of course they'll behave more online. Flip it, imagine they don't. Facebook changes its algorithms like that. It changes it and your entire business model could be flipped. You've got a great way of communicating to customers, but hang on a minute, Facebook's just changed the game. And now actually this algorithm doesn't work quite as well or another company maybe steps in. So our resilience is absolutely about thinking of the, not the worst, but the alternative. I think we generally want that confirmation bias of what we're doing is right, but actually we do need to play. And when you do play, with the opposite. So imagine that you had your scenario. So Liz said that the hospitality events industry or people are gonna come back and really want to experience things. I mean, certainly the research is showing that people really desire to get back into the local high streets and get into bars and restaurants and do and travel and all of that. I've got my own personal bucket list going. But actually, if we play with the opposite, we, we can start playing with the alternatives if that isn't the case. And when you do that, uh, the good thing to you can give students. So if you ask the students what they think they're certain about, it could be just a really small part about their lives or society or or it could be about um, experiences or hobbies or it could be about the sector that they, you know, you're getting them to talk about. But actually, when you get them to play this, they can start to think about what they like in the scenario. That's the opposite. The reasons why things may not turn out as they planned that what, what things might work, what things won't work, what things they could do in the opposite scenario. And that's where innovation can happen. So what do you like? What works? What doesn't work? Are absolutely crucial. So all of this playfulness I, I use to challenge our retailers I use to challenge my team I use to challenge my own thinking because I'm in danger of trying to do something that I want to be true but I'm not building enough resilience in my own company if I'm not thinking that maybe what I want won't happen and if you think about uh, the live students have led from thinking about a future, which is they go to university, they go to bars, they, they have a great time, they have a lovely university life, that has been flipped on its head. So now they're having to shape it on the hoof, but actually having preparedness to play will make them more resilient. So when we go back to what do we teach? So I was thinking back at my experience of teaching in uh, Leeds Beckett, M models and processes, you know, you'd, you'd give students frameworks. Are these frameworks gonna last? Are these frameworks still valid? There's always a lag in research. What extent are we able to let them become current? Because it's actually much more important they have a, a long-term view. And I think it's a big worry in academia often that the research is lagging. To, to what extent do we give them a chance to test things in reality? Um, do we ask the students to walk in the shoes of other organisations? So 
a lot of the stuff we used to do in entrepreneurship was, hey, come up with an idea, whatever, then you pitch it and it's a Dragon's Den style pitch. And, you know, you're putting your business idea together. That's one experience. But actually, why not be in, an, in a scenario where all of this is happening to you? So now you're running a hotel and a pandemic's hit. What do you do? So we have reaction, we have action. But what, what has this COVID-19 experience taught us? It's taught us that there's innovation that can happen. So we've had gin distilleries turn into hand sanitizer makers. We've had engineers create ventilation equipment, ventilators. So there are loads of uh, ways in which businesses have quickly adapted and we absolutely need to ensure our students have that sense that they could do something. So innovation, shaping, Shaping the future is a big one for me. So when we used to do the future of meeting study, when I talk about the future of business and the future of places, I always talk about the fact that we all have agency in shaping the future. The future doesn't just happen to us and we don't react, just react to it. We shape it and we shape it because we have ex we put expectations. We, we consider the predictable, the unpredictable, the what we want and the what we don't want. And then we start to work out what we don't want and how can we shape a future that is different to that. So my whole thing with Shop Happy was, I don't like the future being put in front of me by Jeff Bezos from Amazon. I would like to shape an alternative, thanks. Now I have a sense of agency that we all have a role to play because probably I interacted in that future of meeting study and it had a major impact on me. But if you have a sense of agency as educators, you will pass that to your students. So disruptive thinking is about being open-minded, is enabling people to question the theory, question the model. Does it really fit? Question it, challenge it. It's also about resourcefulness. A lot of these businesses that have reacted have done it with very limited resources. They've used things like digital because it's been able to, it's been able to test a product without perhaps the outlay. So resourcefulness, the ability to maybe look at a network and think wider. And the resourcefulness also comes from a capacity of learning that is beyond the sector that you start to cross pollinate ideas. You see things that come in another sector and think, could this work here? So for the art shop, it was looking at perhaps education and how things were going online. Could I do that in my little shop? Um, for the pizza cafe, it was probably looking at models like HelloFresh, deliveries, boxes, ingredients. Can I do that for my business? So being resourceful is key, non-judgmental of ideas. So, you know, you, you're not judging your own ideas. You're not, you, you're actually able to enable people to come up with suggestions and innovations and no idea too silly. In our, in Saatchi and Saatchi have a thing, uh, their strap line is nothing is impossible. In uh, Shop Happy, we have no idea too daft is what we say. But basically, don't judge the idea. Let it let it come out and let, let your students get as much creativity as they can in the classroom, because that will give them the motivation, the self-determination and the ability to innovate. There's not one answer to anything. Now, that's one thing that students or I remember always hated. But we're permanently operating in grey and nuanced answers. So we're not looking for not one answer. We're looking at the clever thinking behind it. It's the ability for the students to be proactive in shaping the future, being optimistic. Optimistic, how do you, how the, how the heck do you teach optimism? Perhaps there's whole things around lifestyle that we need to be thinking in terms of what we're providing the students. These are foundations for living, not just succeeding in one career. So what extent are they able to look after their mental health? You know, how do they stabilize themselves? Uh, you know, what, what can we do to try and help them see the positives out of things constantly? Risk-taking behaviour, I think, has to, be, has to be encouraged to some degree. I mean, I'm not saying go to Vegas and, and have a gamble calculated risk-taking. But it is important for the students to understand that their career might be taking different leaps, changing things. But underneath it all is agency. Have I got a role to shape this sector? Could I be the influencer? Have I got control? Can I contribute? Because that's what we're gonna to need to take the industry forward. So uh, the takeaways 
from uh, the perspective of um, for educators, I think uh, one of the things that I'd love you to do is if you haven't done it before is take scenarios where you ask them for certainties and switch it, flip it. Uh, do that with accepted truths or norms, challenge everything that we're seeing around us because we need people to be questioning it to shape different, different futures. We need to be looking at multiple foundations. So uh, one of the things when I went back, when I went to university, which was decades ago, my first, uh, first degree was at Lancaster University. They did a program which was independent studies and it enabled a student to create their own pathways based on anything, whether they wanted to do psychology, Spanish, physics, you name it, they could put it in. I constantly felt when I was working in academia that we were too narrow that it's absolutely fundamental that you give people opportunities to try a different subject because that wider reference point is going to hold them in better stead than just focusing on one single career. And resilient mindsets. So testing mindsets would be, you know, the door closes, a scenario, the door closes, what do you do? Do you wait for the handout? when the COVID crisis hits, when there's another pandemic, which there will be. So the wider ground in the scenarios, the ability to do practical exercises, pitching your business ideas is great, but let them have experience of then living that business in some way, facing the challenges that real businesses face. And then there's this wider foundation around mindsets, mental health. Are you teaching them to do their own accounts? to work in a freelance way, to understand how to negotiate a contract. You are not obviously delivering apprenticeships, but you are giving students, and it's really, I think, fundamental that we give the students opportunities to get wider life skills. I always remember the personal development plans and you build in your career. It's almost everything is too structured. And then when something hits it, it blows it completely and will, will hamper someone having their plan disrupted perhaps having a general feel of what people want to do and helping them pursue it in all sorts of ways might be a better option in the uncertain waters we're in. So disruptive thinking. It's ultimately saying that there isn't a path, that paths are made by walking. And it's one of the things that I always go back to when I'm facing my own challenges in the business, when I'm looking at what's happening in the world in general is that you see these people pioneering change, whether it's the junk food project, whether it's um, hotels adapting in different ways, or whether it's you as educators doing things completely differently. You're operating in fog, but you're finding the path, you're making it. And I think the more we can enable our students to understand that they're operating in uncertainty constantly, just as Stephen said at the start, but we give them the resilient skills to have confidence in every step they're taking is a learning experience. If you, if you fail, you learn. It's a good thing. But you're obviously always going to be in some way breaking new ground and you should be proud of trying to break new ground, I think is something. So having courage is really crucial. And I think when you go back to thinking about the graduates that have you have freed into the universe of hospitality events tourism think of the ones that have been the most resilient and maybe some of these skill sets around op optimism and mindset will be there and so the, the idea really is like when you work in an agile business is how can I replicate this how can I get more of my students emerging with a mindset that will get them through what will be challenging decades ahead for them in relation to all sorts of trends, not just COVID, sustainability, the environment, the planet. So to what extent are we helping them consider the alternatives and shape a better future for us all?